Welcome back, everybody. Hello, welcome back to Marshall Gold Discovery State Park. Hello. Hello. Thanks for joining us. I see people signing in. Nice to see everybody. Hello, thanks for joining us everybody. Welcome back to Marshall Gold Discoveries State Historic Park. This is our last segment of the day and last segment of our virtual Coloma Gold Rush Live 2020. We are so excited to be here again. Thank you all for joining. I see lots of names of people who have been joining us all along. So welcome back. I want to wait just a couple more seconds. I know there were some other groups that were going to be joining. All right. Again, thank you all so much for joining us for our first virtual event here at Marshall Gold Discovery State Historic Park. Since we couldn't bring you Gold Rush Live in person this year, we wanted to still bring it to you in some form of virtually. So uh, yesterday we met four different characters of the Gold Rush. Today we've met four different ones, or three so far. Um, and today, right now at two o'clock, we're gonna be meeting our last group. And I'm just so thankful for everybody joining us um, all of our staff and docents have really enjoyed being able to bring you some interpretation, some part of the gold rush, um, and hopefully we can do more of these throughout the year as well. So what we're going to do right now is we have our miners down at the river, and I'm going to introduce them in just a minute. We had a really good question at our last segment that I wasn't able to answer. So I wanted to show you guys, uh, one of the classes asked, what would an ounce of gold look like? So in my hand right here, is a vial of gold. This is real gold from one of these miners down here that has found it. This is roughly two ounces of gold, okay? So I think, you guys see all those little nuggets in there? This is about two ounces of gold. Real gold, I can feel the weight in my hand. I, it's, it's heavy. <laughs> so that was a great question we got at the last one and I wanted to just touch on that really quickly, um, the, the real gold that we have here. So without further ado, I'm going to turn you around to our miners in the river and we're going to see what they're up to. Howdy miners! Hello! Hi! How are we doing down here today? Not bad today. Not bad. Not no. bad at all. <laughs> so what kind of tools are you guys using today down here? So we're looking at different ways we mine and we're actually experimenting, if you will, with different versions. So our earliest example of a rocker box is our dugout. You can see it's actually just half a log and then it has a sieve to separate the material. So you dump the raw material into the sieve, continually put water over that and rock it back and forth. That way the material will separate itself and it'll hopefully end up running out the trough. Right, so that's sort of about 1848, early 49. By the time we get to 49, we have a little bit of a more substantial rocker that looks a little more like what most people are used to seeing. Doing the same thing. He's consistently dumping water onto that. The idea being the water works for you. Right? We're already working consistently all day. So how do we actually make the process function a little easier for us? And if we can add water, whether it's through the use of sluices, long toms, or consistently dumping water into the sieve, it'll expedite the process for us. I love uh, the versatility and just using what you have by doing the dugout. It works out pretty well. I'm actually pulling a fair bit of black sand out of that. And if you look all the way to the far end, we have a rocker that's probably the most advanced of what we have, and that's about 1850. That differs only in the, in the facet that it actually has riffles in the trough. So hopefully the black sand will get caught behind it as opposed to are actually going to scoop out the black sand in a straight run. So you're kind of 
saving yourself a step with that. A little bit, yeah. And so after you've gotten the black sand uh, down into the, the bottom of your rocker box, what happens then? So once we get our black sand, you can kind of take a peek. If I pull the, the sieve off, you see the material that's left in the bottom of the rocker? And you can see it's already separated into black sand. You can sort of see it striated throughout there. Then we'll go ahead and take that material and actually pan it out individually. We'll run it through sieves that we have back there on the side so to get rid of some of the larger rocks. Then we'll put it in our pan and we'll start working on our pan to get rid of all of the mud and all of the extra material. And sooner or later, when you get down to black sand, if you're lucky, you find a gold nugget. Here's an example. So um, you guys are in 1850 about now. How much is an ounce of gold worth? $16 locally and the federal government will pay you 20. Now why is there a difference? Profiting for the local people. They, they make, they'll make that and then they'll send it to the government and they will get the $20 for the ounce and they'll make up the difference. Okay. Um, so I think we'll, I'm going to step back a little bit and watch the process again. So everybody can kind of watch how that rocker box works. And then you are you... You see it the best out of Mr. Snook's box. All right, Mr. Snook, we're going to come over here. All right. Do you want to rock it while I dump the water on it for you? I got it both ways. about as much of the small stuff out that I can get. But you can see where the, uh, the smaller particles trap up along here, or they trap right behind here, and this is where we're gonna find the gold. So we would take all of this, scoop it out, start panning. Now you guys have been working down here since sunrise? About sunrise, yeah. About sunrise. How much do you have to show for all your efforts today? Actually, we've done pretty well. If you're really curious, take a peek. We're pulling color out of pretty much every, I don't know how close to get to your screen. That's good. Out of every pan. We also pulled some strange silver thing that we're debating on what that is right now. <laughs> but you can sort of see the gold in there. That's pretty good. Those yeah. are actually decent size. It's decent. So. And what brought you guys to California in the first place? Where'd you come from? Why'd you leave? So we actually came, ultimately came from different spots. Uh, I came from New Haven, Connecticut. I was in uh, New York, Long Island, South Carolina. We met up to come actually initially to go to Oregon and sort of changed our plans. As we were halfway to Oregon, we heard about the gold rush and decided that sounded like we'd have a better, a better time of it. <laughs> Maybe make our pile. I have no intention of returning home, so. Have you been in Coloma this whole time since you got to California? Uh, we go from Coloma up to the Middle Fork, go to Murderer's Bar. We go up and down to Sacramento, because when we're not mining, we're actually bringing ferrying goods back and forth from Sacramento, from Stockton. And what about weather? How does weather affect you looking for gold? Are you out here when it's 100 degrees, when it's snowing and raining? It depends. We're a company. So we're actually a company of people who pulled all of our resources to come to California. So there's half of our company that's not even here right now. They're pursuing something else to add to the company fund. And we stayed a company where a lot of kind of our counterparts, if you will, decided not to. They broke up once they got to California. We have to go through roughly 80 buckets of dirt a day in order just to survive. So that's per person. Uh, what types of food do you eat and what do you drink when you're down here? Ship's biscuits, a lot of beef. Right? I mean, it's California, there's beef everywhere, there's cattle everywhere. 
so that's a definite staple. We enjoy tinned oysters, tinned peaches, everything else is pretty well tinned. Uh, water, switchel, salt pork. Salt pork. And I know uh, a couple of our classes should know these answers, but uh, a ship's biscuit. Why is that a specific thing? What's different about those? They're a very hard biscuit, so they travel well. Mm -hmm. It's something where uh, it has no moisture, so it's not going to go as rancid as like flour by itself would over a, over a long haul. There you go. That's what one looks like. And they're pretty hard, right? Oh yeah. Well, I can break it. <laughs> so would you need to, how would you eat those? Well, you can break them up with anything, right? Break them up with a tool, but actually they, it's like a heavy duty cracker. So you can fry them in bacon grease. Do you guys drink water out of the river? Yeah, we do. And store it in, in our case, gourds. Take a peek there. So there's different ways to carry water glass bottles. Uh, did your family come with you? They did not. Do you have any intention of going home? Absolutely no. Why should I go back to an industrial city? I don't want to go there. Well, and how was the pay compared to My out average here? labor is making about $300 a year. So I mean, I can go back and work at Volcanic Arms like my brother, but I don't see the point in that. Um, yes, so the, the biscuits are kind of like hardtack, correct? Essentially. They were the yeah. staple of the British Navy and the United States Navy because they stored well. So we've noticed that everybody is in red shirts. Is that your company thing or? One of the most, if not the most prevalent clothing fashion style. It's workwear. And do you get hot? Everybody wants to know if you get hot in those layers. Let's see everybody's outfits here. Not really. No. Wool blocks out the UV, mm -hmm. so actually not. And it's 100% breathable. So once we start to sweat, I'm probably, uh, I'm probably no hotter than anybody else, right? If I were in shorts and a t-shirt. It is cooler by the river. Yes, that helps too. Yeah, there's a nice breeze wet. right when now. We're wet all the time. Hot, we've got, uh, yeah. Just jump in the river. What are your hopes? What were your hopes when you came out to California? And then what are your hopes now that you know how hard it is and what, li what life is like out here in California? What are your goals from here on out? Still to make a lot of money. I go. figure I'll get involved in land speculation. Mm -hmm. I hear San Francisco is a good place to do that. I'm still working on making enough money to retire. Retire? No, I'm already retired. Does anybody else have any other questions for us? How much gold do you find a day? So on average? It depends. If we want, if we're lucky and we pull about an ounce, that's gonna get us maybe a night in a hotel, a dinner, maybe the third option to use the bath water. So it's more not necessarily what we're gonna turn up, right? It's gonna be dependent upon where we go, right? Where's the gold deposit? As opposed to what can we do with what we find? And when you work it out, you have to move on. What do you do for entertainment and to relax? Well, there's dances all the way up at Murderer's Bar all the time. So we walk wherever we go. You know, that's a, it's a We tell stories. We read a lot of books. We read aloud. We really try to find newspapers that are at least three months old. <laughs> new. Relatively recent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes we'll go into uh, Sacramento City for supplies, and sometimes we'll go into Yerba Buena to pick up mail. We just had one question. I forgot what it was. <laughs> um, somebody says, enjoy their retirement. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a long way to go. <laughs> um, can you tell me how you guys kind of pick a location when you move, when you've kind of emptied one spot and you move on to a new spot, how do you decide where to stop and start a new claim? Well, there's a couple of ways you can do that. First and foremost, we go where we hear there's a strike, right? So news travels really fast in mining camps. So the intent is sort of, well, if I hear there's a strike, I should go too, right? Because I might find my fortune there. 
but as part of what we do here, you're looking at the curvature of the, the banks of the river, right? You want to try to figure out where the likelihood of that material will be. You watch how fast the river is rushing, and in certain spots you can see that there are eddies where it is very calm, which means that the rush of the river has stopped, and therefore the gold will sink to the bottom at that point. And that's what we try to mine that area where the water is no longer as rough and as fast as it is up the stream. So you have to remember gold is heavy, so it is going to slow down first and it's going to sink to the bottom. And over time, even through all the silt, it's going to keep working itself farther and farther down until it hits bedrock. So one of the things we're going to be doing too is that we're going to keep digging until we get down to bedrock it's more likely that we're going to find some of the plaster gold there. Um, so are mining camps only for men? And then another question that kind of fits into that. Do you ever see any children or family near your camps? Mining so, camps are not only just for men. Uh, very few, at, we've seen at this point, uh, families have come although we know that quite a few of them went to Oregon. Um, they're starting to trickle in. It's not unusual, but there are roughly 100 men to every one woman, wherever you go. You have so to, it's quite an unusual You have novelty. to remember, the average age of a kind of demographic that you're looking at is somewhere between 17, 18, and about 25. And they are young men, they're escaping the eastern seaboard. They're escaping the, the rules and regiments of home, right? So it's a little different. It's not a place, especially in 48 and 49 and kind of early 50, that you see a lot of women. And when you do, right, they're running laundries, they're running mercantile establishments, they're running boarding houses, restaurants, and they're actually doing financially very well. I know when we talked to um, Mrs. Talbot earlier, our merchant, she was talking about um, selling bread and pies to some of the miners. Mrs. Talbot jacks up the price an awful lot. <laughs> she knows how to mine us is the problem. And I think that's a pretty typical response, oh. a reaction between the, the miners and the merchants. There's some, some tension there. Well, and I'm not sure her scales are completely balanced either. I think there may be a little bit, a little, a little funny business going on there. Uh, to what do you refer her balanced scales? Well, I don't think she holds them. I think we ought to take our own scales next time we go. I do know that she has wet fingers when she puts the pinch of gold in. Well, I don't know, but she's holding a, a shirt for me that I haven't paid off yet, but I'm not going to pay it off until she figures it out. At the tab, I'm not picking it up. That reminds me, the laundress has a shirt of mine for a year now. Well, you're never going to get that back. She won't turn it over. Um, <laughs> another question. Are those special pans or just normal cooking pans that you have? They're milk pans. Milk pans. It was later. Uh, uh, we, we've seen people come in later that they're actually been made but made specifically for this purpose. But originally, they are milk pans that came from the farms. Now, uh, Mr. Caldwell will show you something that has a wooden patea. So this is a patea. And it's actually one of the earliest ways to plaster mine with a pan, if you will. Right? We know that South Americans, Peruvians, uh, folks from Sonora were some of the earliest people to come Chile, and they brought the batea with them. They already had their own experiences with mining, so bringing the batea was sort of a natural progression to come to California with it. And it's the earliest, or one of the earliest, methods to mine with a, basically a pan. All right, any other questions? Oh, have you done any mining near Colorado River? No. Is there a strike there? Colorado. Should we go? Should we look into it? Should they go? Yeah. I hear there's one in Australia. Maybe we should leave. I thought like Australia. Australia. There's the Indian Territory, which is uh, east from here, that some people may call Colorado Territory, but uh, we're not familiar with anything. In California region called the Colorado River. Georgia and North Carolina had rushes, but none of us went. 
All right, well, thank you all so much for joining us today. We'll let you get back to your, your gold painting. We know you have how many more buckets of sand to go through before the end of the day? 30. 30 more. All right, well, thank you again for joining us. I'm gonna flip this around. Oh, that's a good, one last question. Do you guys uh, fish in the river? We can. Yeah. All right, you, is this successful right here? They've been jumping out there. We've been watching them yeah. all afternoon. It, it depends on the season. Uh huh. It depends on how much the river's been altered. Uh, people are up and down the banks, so there's long toms, there's flutter wheels, there's all sorts of mining equipment pulling water away and diverting the water. All right. Everybody's saying thank you. Thank you, guys. I'm going to flip it around really quick. I want to thank everybody so much for joining us the last two days for our virtual Coloma Gold Rush Live event. We have had so much fun bringing this to you. There is so much more to this story. Uh, so we invite you all to come visit, visit us at the park. We are open. The museum is open. We are observing all the social distancing rules. Uh, we are often gold panning and guided tours. They're just kind of, um, we're limited to time and space on those. But there is so much more to this story. And again, we invite you all to come here. We will be posting more videos throughout the year as um, thank you for helping us learn how all of these Facebook Lives work. So thanks for sticking with us through some of the, the glitches. Um, and continue asking questions. We're gonna be posting all these videos onto our park YouTube channel. So that is Marshall Gold Discovery, SHP. And if you search that in the word channel, you should be able to find us. All these videos are gonna go up there along with a bunch of videos that we made back in the spring. And we will continue to keep posting more. So thank you all. I am so glad all of our classes were able to join us. You guys had great questions. So thank you for coming up with some good ones. And we hope to see you all in person again soon. Bye everybody, stay safe.